Hey there, welcome to XR Industry Leaders with Arbor XR. My name is Brad Scoggin, and I am the CEO and one of three co-founders of Arbor XR. And we've had the opportunity of working with thousands of companies since 2016. And we've learned a ton about what it takes for XR to be successful in your organization. And I'm Will Stackable, co-founder and CMO. This podcast is all about interviewing the leaders who are on the ground making XR happen today. True pioneers in the space, from Amazon, Walmart, and UPS, to Coke, Pfizer, and beyond to uncover the pitfalls, lessons learned, and secrets that you can use to help grow XR in your organization. All right, Nick. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I would love to hear, you've been at Pfizer for almost six years, but before we even jump into that, I would love to hear about uh, a little bit of your personal journey into XR. Sure. Yeah, it's uh, great to be in the podcast. Thank you. Thank you both for, for having me on. Um, my personal journey, you know, maybe into XR even starts before I was in XR at Pfizer. You know, I, I joined Pfizer in 2016 through a rotational program, the digital rotational program, where I, I rotated through a few different teams um, and ended up landing into a team uh, that was doing uh, innovation um, specifically for uh, the manufacturing side of things, a digital innovation team. Um, and really, you know, what they were doing was focusing on identifying um, which XR technologies were going to unlock the most business value in the shortest amount of time. And we were looking into things like uh, AR, VR, 3D scanning, drones, 3D printing, you know, everything at that time in 2018 that was, that was you know, clearly starting to show up on the Gartner reports and, and, and really starting to get some traction across the enterprise uh, landscape. Um, and after doing a few proof of concepts and, and starting to see the demand coming in from uh, the different organizations uh, across Pfizer, it came pretty apparent that the one that was going to have the most immediate value was going to be VR and, and kind of the 3D scanning concept. Um, and, and as you guys know, they, they marry together pretty well. Um, so I really found XR through a team, uh, you know, rotating through the rotational program, and you know, I, I did I did rotations, in information security, and in, uh, ERP, SAP deployments. And as soon as I got into the innovation space where we were working with XR, it was you know it really lit me up and, and fueled my passions. Um, and you know, I I, I love marrying, um, you know, thinking creatively and uh, understanding. Um, problems, business problems, and thinking of new and creative ways, especially with new technology to solve them. So it was really an immediate click for me. Um, and it's where I decided to begin my career. So it's been about four, four and a half, five years now, um, working in that space uh, at Pfizer. Um, and we've, we've really seen it grow pretty, pretty exponentially just internally at Pfizer. Um, in terms of XR, the focus on VR and, and AR and, and, and other 3D uh, uh, capabilities. So um, kind of found me, I guess you could say. <laughs> well, that, that's, that's very interesting. So your, your initial exposure to XR was at Pfizer. Yeah, I mean, I, I dabbled with VR and XR, um, you know, in a consumer sense, you know, and I think when I was looking into it, it was, I think the whole industry was still really young. So it's almost like I got into XR right when the industry really started to, it's for its gears, really started to start turning. Um, so I've just always have had that enterprise lens on things. Um, it's almost like enterprise first for me. Yeah, that's very cool. Uh, the timing is so important. I mean, even for us, we, my background was in nonprofit space, and then we kind of shifted. We just hit it at the right time. I mean, I, I wasn't, I was not really an XR enthusiast until it was time. <laughs> and I think sometimes that works out really well. Uh, I think something else we'd be interested to hear about would be, you, you talk about kind of your experience in leading change uh, in organizations. And with XR specifically, I mean, it sounds like Pfizer had a process of identifying what types of technology that you did want to adopt and move forward with. But once you got, got it narrowed down to that short list, what was the process like for you to sell to leadership, to sell internally, to actually move from, okay, here's a technology that we're excited about to begin kind of the front edge of, of implementation? Yeah. Um, you know, in, in big corporate structures you know change moves at a very slow pace so i think the biggest word i would hit home here is consistency 
and also, um, you know, not being deterred, uh, you know, the first time you try to bring in a new technology or a new concept and it's, it's not necessarily given, you could be really excited upon it about it and it could be, you know, you could see all the value it's going to unlock in the short term and the long run for a company. And then you could take it to somebody and they're not going to have that shared vision and, and, um, to not get deterred by that, um, and to consistently, uh, find ways to, um, get it in front of the right people, you know, and, and, and continue to, to, to bring it to your manager and, and understand and do your own research. So every time you, you're having those conversations, you know, you're, you're able to sway their perception maybe a little bit more every single time, you know, and eventually it sways in your favor. Um, and, uh, you know, <laughs> I think one of the advantages to being at a, a company so long, which I know is, is unheard of in, in, in today's day and age, you know, especially for the younger generation is the longer you're there, the more people know your face and they know kind of what you're representing and the type of solutions that you're supporting. And, um, it took multiple years to, to really have its sway to get momentum going. And we didn't really get into how we've built our own internal VR 3d team at Pfizer, but you know, for, for that point to happen, it took, it took two years to just proof of concept and, and being, um, uh, consistent with what we are finding and, uh, identifying clearly where the, the business value was going to be. Many of our listeners uh, are either doing a pilot project right now in their company or they're in the process of transitioning from, from pilot to some kind of scale. Could you talk a little bit about just um, doing the pilot project and then what it took to, to get the sign off to go from pilot to some larger scale? Yeah, you know, with, with the pilot projects, um, it, it, it you really have to find somebody at, you know, at a manufacturing level, it's at a company like Pfizer, it's so big, you have to find, you have to, you have to find someone at a manufacturing level that's at the site that has some general understanding of the technology or else it's not, it's going to be really hard to get things moving um, because you're going to spend the first couple months of that engagement, just bringing them up to speed. Right. So if you already have someone that and they're out there. You might, you you know, you might have tried and and have not found that right person. But once you find that person that understands really the value that this technology can unlock, it's going to make the whole pilot and the whole project go a lot smoother. Um, in terms of identifying it, it's something that uh, you know, it took a lot of just going and understanding and hearing what specific site needs were. Um, specifically, our focus is in training. So going and meeting with training leads at different manufacturing sites and understanding where their pain points are and not just automatically assuming VR is going to fix everything, but understanding what, you know, the strengths of virtual reality are, which is, you know, creating time and space for lack of a better word to train people in, um, that are, uh, whereas you wouldn't have access normally. Right. Um, so understanding what those specific nuances were and focusing on them and building out, um, you know, a consumable proof of concept that is, um, not biting off a bigger chunk of what you want to accomplish, you know, making it realistic, right. And, and setting those expectations up front and having the people that you're creating the proof of concept with along for that entire journey as well, because it's new for the whole organization. It's new for everybody. Um, so in terms of identifying the pilot, it's going and talking to those, those, those people on, on the bottom lines, and then also having an understanding of the technology and knowing where its strengths are and where its weaknesses are and, and finding that correct marriage. Um, in terms of scale, you know, for lack of, you know, for lack of a better boost, you know, COVID really, you know, I think really shifted everything and the way that the entire enterprise industry is viewing collaboration and training. And, um, you know, in 2020, when it hit, you know, we just saw <laughs> an 
an enormous demand to take everything virtual instantly. Um, and, you know, at that point it was, it was pretty clear to us that, you know, using a vendor model to create all of our content was going to cost us more in the long run than it was going to save us. Um, especially when you're working with trainings and different type of, uh, procedures at a site level that change. <laughs> um, so if you're not owning the experience, the content, um, any of that, you know, from the start, every time that a certain change is going to come in for, at a procedural level, at a site level, which happens a lot in manufacturing, um, you're going to have to be going back to the vendor and, and, and trying to, uh, make a change request. And it's going to, it's going to, it's going to add up over time. Um, so the realisticness and the feasibility of scaling up came down to kind of building out that business case and showing those numbers that made leadership realize, um, at the same time, having a, a hefty backlog of inquiries and different projects that were coming in to be able to, um, kind of show that, you know, there, there is a long-term vision here, um, and, uh, it's not going away. And if this is something that we want to take seriously, it's, you know, the, the upfront investment and getting the structure in place is going to pay off dividends in the long run. So as you're going through that process of, of selling again, you know, the initial proof of concept and then going to scale, was it, was there a moment or, or where leadership says, okay, now we get it. Or was it really just this ongoing, like you said, consistent process the whole time? Yeah, there's definitely like a change of heart, you know, um, uh, you know, the two years of proof of concepts and, and, and identifying those and presenting them out and, you know, nothing really moving too much to a little bit more of a sense of urgency being built around it just because of, you know, that 2020 mark, uh, our sites saying that they needed these types of solutions because they had no way to actually unlock these trainings um, for individuals when we were in Operation Lightspeed at Pfizer to make as much vaccine as possible. Um, you know, it, 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 it was kind of a perfect storm to make that case, right? And um, when that happens, you know, I think everyone was a little bit more open to trying things differently at that time. Um, so I think we capitalize that in some sense, I'll capitalize on that in some sense, but, um, at the same time, I don't think it means that, that I, I think it's inevitable for organizations for, for that to come in and for, um, leaders and management to kind of have, uh, that realization. Mm -hmm. So you had been built, you were building the momentum and COVID was just kind of the, the accelerant. Yeah. You mentioned numbers being important to make the case. Could you share a little bit about what um, what have, what have you seen? What what's been successful, and what what numbers could you share with us about your your programs? Sure. Um, as I mentioned, we are, our main focus in manufacturing is uh, in training, um, and as I mentioned, you know, one of the main use cases that got a lot of uh, uh, feedback was a training we built around upskilling um, new workforce that was coming in that needed to be trained on how to operate and maintain uh, um, production lines um, during during the pandemic. Um, there was a large amount of uh, the employees that were hired um, to support those efforts, and there was no time and no actual physical environment for them to get the repetitions and the experience they needed to carry out the tasks on the production line um, to get familiar with what they had to do and perform their job. So there was this bottleneck. Um, and what we've seen is at a manufacturing shop floor level, um, there, the time it takes a fresh onboarded um, employee or technician or operator that comes into the manufacturing space to get proficient and signed off on a on the job sign from an on the job sign off an OJT perspective 
um, through all of the trainings he needs to learn, it takes about a year and a half in total time. Um, and, uh, that fluctuates and go up, can go up and down depending, you know, that's about an average and that can go up and down depending on, uh, their role. And a lot of that time is just waiting for the right moment, the right setup, the right scenario, proper access to a certain line to get enough repetitions for them to feel familiar and be able to go and do an on-the-job sign-off with someone watching them and go through from start to end and completion with no with no help, right? I think so, you, you just described like the dream scenario for VR. <laughs> I mean, like word for word. Like, yeah, sorry. That, that's, that, that was beautiful. Yeah. And it's, you know, it, it, takes, it takes someone four to six repetitions to, to get familiar on average. Um, with this, any type of process, whether it's setup, cleaning, maintenance, um, an intervention, uh, anything, um, and it's really hard to recreate these 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 scenarios. So, um, you know, we immediately saw when we started to roll out the training as people started to go through it that you know uh, our training leads were reporting back you know about a forty percent reduction. In total training time, you know, cutting those can repetitions. Can you say that again? Forty percent. What's what's the baseline number of hours? Or so what is that's a significant number. That's wild. Can you yeah, give a context was, for how big of a de decrease of train for the training time was? It's like set, it was like in the seven hundred, seven hundred thirty-two hours down to like four hundred something per per um. Yeah, per uh, per new joining. And and how do you mind me asking? Is there is there any? Could you think share anything about how often you're doing new train uh, training for new employees? Is that daily, weekly? Is what's the? Is it a constant churn of of new people? Yeah, I mean it fluctuates um, around initiatives and priorities um, and by site and <laughs> by region, but. Uh, it's pretty, it's pretty consistent, you know, I, I mean, it, there, there's always someone waiting to be trained, I would say, you know, like at, at the end of the day, you know, there's, there's, there needs, there, there's a gap between having access and, and, and having access to training. Um, I think that's pretty standard across the whole, the whole network. So you're saving not just a few hours, but hundreds of hours for every new trainee. What about the quality of the training? D did you see anything? Was there an increase in their efficiency or the redu a reduction of errors once they're on the line? Yeah, I mean, that's something that we're tracking pretty closely. And it's, it's, it's still pretty new. You know, um, you know, we rolled this out. 2021. So, you know, to get these high, the over uh, high level um reduction in quality metrics it's something just at a site level where we've really started to roll this out that we have to start monitoring from the top down um unfortunately we don't have that by area but it's by site so um you know i think we anticipate to see the overall quality increase well the, the amount of errors which at least improve quality of uh of work performance and improve um over the next two years but it's something that we're, we're kind of waiting for those numbers to come back on right now yeah that's wild that you said something a few minutes ago you said um that it's just a matter of time until organizations realize the efficacy of vr and you i mean that's a pretty bold statement but i guess <laughs> when you're seeing that type of reduction in training time when you're seeing that type of an improvement um in retention, it really, every time we do one of these, it's just another wow for us. Like we're, we are in the middle. I, I, I feel less and less like I'm making an overstatement when I say we're in the middle of a learning revolution because that's, that's not insignificant. I mean, and even, I mean, 40% on its own is significant, but then when you say, well, that's 40% of 700 or 600 hours, <laughs> right? Like that's, that's a big deal. Um, it, uh, like Will said earlier, a lot of our, a lot of our listeners are moving from the pilot to scale. Um, could you share just some of the pain points that you had to 
um, work through as you went from pilot to scale and, and anything you can share about what scale looks like for you guys today or in the future? Pilot to scale, you know, you know, the, kind of the big difference in pilot to scale is is working with vendors and and you know a third party being in between you yourself having kind of full control over everything versus um, you know being uh, there's there's a different model of working. Um, when you're working with a vendor to, to create what you're doing versus working with a team full of Pfizer colleagues or a team for a group full of internal colleagues. And it, there's just an inherently a different dynamic there. Um, and the pain points would be, you know, uh, for lack of a better term, like you're, you're, you're kind of working on the vendor timeline when you enter that agreement to build that proof of concept, to build that, whatever you're, whatever you're doing. And um, you kind of, lock into a high level scope of what you're going to accomplish in the SOW. Um, <laughs> but most times when you're building these things, things come up, it may be a different direction or it may be a different, maybe there's a step, an extra hand washing or an extra cleaning or something that wasn't accounted for in the beginning of it. And like, instead of having to kind of, synthesize that down to a vendor every time that comes up you're working with a five you're having you're having a colleague to colleague interaction and it's you know we work in a, a scaled agile framework methodology so it's it's as easy as creating a couple user stories and getting it into our developers queues to to make those changes versus having to have kind of a a larger discussion that that you know is going to have to to go to on the vendor side, you know, to, to, to make those changes. And that always comes with, well, how big's the change? How much is that? It's going to increase the timeline, you know, this can require more resources, et cetera, you know, and it's, um, that proved to be frustrating on the pilot side. Um, so by having more control and bringing that development in house, once we started to really scale up and, and build these internally, um, that was an immediate relief, uh, that I saw, um, and just made um i would say the overall quality of we, we are producing um better as well too because i think the reality is when you start off these proof of concepts is you can go in and then any, any xr technology for the most part unless it's very cut and dry or you're making it like an infographic or something like that like you're going to go in with an idea and you're going to be halfway through it and you're going to realize something that maybe you didn't think of in the beginning. Um, whether it's being able to manipulate a certain piece of equipment, a certain way with a controller or not, or maybe needing to add an animation to actually account for that, or maybe the procedure or the SOP missed a step, you know, and, and you didn't account for that. And, um, or there's an opportunity for innovation, you know, and, um, adding some type of hand tracking capability to it that maybe you didn't think of in the beginning. And it's best to, to go into them, I think, with the option to explore those areas and make those adjustments um, versus having to um, stick to, you're, you're gonna unlock more value being able to innovate in those phases versus having to stick to a, you know, what was agreed upon on an SOP. And that was, that was a frustrating part in, in the pilot phase because yeah, there, there's just, it's just that dynamic that that's tough. Um, and, you know, scaling up really for us, just looks like bringing, you know, user experience design interface design, um, storyboarding asset creation and and you need development in-house which was it, it took some time to get the right people in place and to get the the structure working in a scaled agile format it's all it was you know there wasn't there wasn't you know it's not a perfect fit and and all the right scenario you know in the best case scenarios but you know um once it's in place it works um and 
then you get to be a bit more specific around the business cases that you're going to work on um, that are going to unlock the highest amount of value versus just kind of trying to fit into the mold of a proof of concept that maybe was just given to you because that was the, the only option, right? Um, you're, you're able to kind of uh, be a bit more specific on what you're going to work on um, because you owned end, that, that kind of end to end process and you're, you're in the more of the scale phase and, you know, just the general awareness is being built, you know, and, and what we've done is kind of created a central channel, I guess, throughout the organization where, you know, even outside of digital organizations are coming to us with questions. And I guess that's another point I could point I could touch on is like, you know, it's really valuable just having pretty standardized, I want to say pitch deck, but informational deck about like, here's the XR industry, here's the projected um, revenue between now and 2030. You know, these are examples of VR trainings, like the, you know, this kind of breaking it down and, and, and in, in layman's terms for somebody that's brand new to, and having those conversations with as many people as you can. And that also starts to change the dialogue internally as well. Um, and that will come back, uh, as we're seeing with different use cases and different ideas and, and, and different opportunities as people generally get more involved and have bigger understanding of it all at the same time, while the overall industry is kind of also making bigger steps and, and increasing its, its, its marketing and, um, uh, general awareness of, uh, what's to come as well. So, um, yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, I think that's a great point. I think it's something that, I mean, it's something we're doing all the time. It's an ongoing education from investors to partners. And, um, I mean, the stats you've shared so far, those are the type of stats that are so helpful for people. And I think it's sometimes uh, something we forget that there is for better or worse, we're, there is kind of this ongoing selling that we're all doing in XR. But thankfully, I mean, there, there is a lot of really, really good data. There's a lot of really interesting, uh, effective use cases. Um, it, I think it's also very interesting that part of the way that you solve um, some of the challenges of going from pilot to scale has been to bring things in house. So uh, a specific question on that. I mean, a lot of a lot of the customers we talk to a lot of companies we talk to are having that specific dis uh, discussion, specifically on device management, do they use their existing in house device management? Do they go out of house for something more specialized? Uh, what, what, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, um, <laughs> there's a lot. I mean, it's it's tricky right now. Um, with device management, you know, with every company is going to be different. Um, every company is going to have a different standard. Um, every company is going to use a different device management platform. You know, I could speak on, on, on an R end and, and, you know, Android is, is tough for us. Right. And, um, from a device management perspective, you know, managing and being able to distribute your, the content you're creating is, is key. Um, and is, is really important to have that aspect of it secured and in place and have a solution that, that is stable and that is, um, you're able to quickly get a new version or a new, uh, build out to your stakeholders and your end users in, in, as efficiently as possible. And it's something that I think Arbor does a great job at, um, you know, it's kind of like a two, there's kind of like two parts. There's like the security side of it. Like, you know, it's standard MDM. Can I put a device, you know, on the network, et cetera. Can I get all the certificates, you know, can it get down, going to be treated the same way as a company device? Can it not be, you know, that's, that's a whole thing that I think the whole industry is figuring out right now as a whole. Um, but in terms of content, you know, and having your own MDM, is, is pretty key, especially if you're creating your own content, um, for your user base. Yeah. I think content is something, well, just the challenges of content in VR 
And it, I mean, that's how it's been for a long time. But f- file sizes in, in the whole your journey that you've described and the need the need to update content quickly, the need the need to up, update content maybe when you weren't expecting to. I think the content po- component is is really significant, um, and maybe more so than a lot of people at the outset realize. Um, yeah, could you just elaborate a little bit more? I'd love to hear. You said you're creating all. Is it all the content in house, or is there a, is there a mix? And and why did you decide to go down that path versus a number of other co- companies similar size are almost exclusively working with external ISVs or app developers? Yeah, I mean we're we're using um, we're creating everything in house, and, and and we've just we've felt that having that control has. Uh, given us better end results than kind of doing a hybrid model or, um, you know, of course, if it's like, you know, a tool or something that is, uh, you know, you can just get a 3d model of online or, you know, it's already out there, you know, we're, we're not just going to recreate everything from scratch, but, um, owning all of the content, um, has provided to be it's given us better end results versus, uh, you know, a partnered approach so far. Um, doesn't mean that, you know, it's off the table in the future. I think it, it, we partner where it makes sense. You know, we're partnered, uh, a few, a few, uh, great partners that are basically enabling our overall development pipeline, right? Like there's, it, it, you look, you think in terms of the development pipeline and creating the content, there's, a lot of different areas from softwares that are creating the models and the environments to the actual experience, like, like in unity or in real and then version controlling and then MDM and, and then, you know, key networking plugins to enable your applications. And, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of moving pieces and we're not going to build all of those in house. We're going to partner where it makes sense, but, um, the content creation is something that I think we've gone to doing fully in house and, um, it's, it's, it's worked for us. <laughs> you know, I, I think it's, it's probably a model that I, I think, I think some companies will have to go on a journey to figure out based on their, their needs. Um, if it's going to make more sense for them or not and, and, and when they're going to make that decision. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, if what you're, if, if what you're creating is very specific and really unique, it's going to be better for you to probably just do it and have the full control versus, um, uh, you know, trying to synthesize that to a third party that's also just going to have to get brought up to speed on everything you're doing anyway. Um, so it's, yeah. It's, it sounds like your team sees this as a technology layer that you're integrating for the for the long haul. It's not just a, something you're bolting on, but this is a core part of training and manufacturing for you guys going forward. Um, I'm curious, I've got one more kind of, maybe this is a hot take, and if you don't have one, it's fine, but headsets. Big, big topic. Everyone has their own opinion. Do you, uh, do you have a perspective on, on, yeah, what to think about when you're looking at headsets? Yeah, um, that was a big thing in the proof of concept phase. You know, I, I'm not going to say I have an allegiance with one brand or, or another. Um, but the biggest thing for me is if they're standalone or not. Um, really, I guess that's a good point to touch on the scale side of things, you know, some of the proof of concepts we were doing, we're working with headsets that had to be tethered to a gaming computer and, and getting everything set up with sensors. And, um, that, that proves to be a real bottleneck, not only on the scalability side, but also on the, and the end user side as well. Um, VR is already new enough for a lot of people and then throwing in a new, kind of uh um process or hardware configuration that that is that is cumbersome as well on top of it is this gonna lead to even less adoption um of the technology in the long run so you know my biggest 
my biggest thing I would say is is if you're looking to to really start to scale and and get it in front of as many users as possible, trying to do as much as you can with with a standalone headset. You know, of course, there's going to be some some use cases that we will need a tethered option, but um, people are very opinion. I, from what I've seen there, you know, I've I've experienced all the newer ones that that have come out so far, and I, I think that they're all kind of relatively right at the same spot. You know, I think that's as, as an industry, there's not one that's like, oh, this is, this is make or break, but that's my, my opinion. Okay. So, so last question, this is kind of a, a future question. Um, it's 10 years from now, we're looking back. What surprises us? The amount of jobs that might be in virtual worlds. <laughs> um, the amount of commerce maybe that's occurring in virtual worlds and, and different type of virtual platforms and communities. Um, and um, so wait, is that a good surprise or a bad surprise? I think they're, I think they're good surprises. I mean, I, you know, I, I think I don't know. The, don't quote me on the statistic, but you know, there's there's some that's around like you know, fifty percent of the jobs that are going to be available in the next ten years aren't even made yet, right? Like, or it might be even a bigger figure than that, right? And I think you know we're at a real foundational stage right now uh, at AWE. I forget who I was who presented this, but they they're talking about it's like a keynote on the metaverse. And by the way, I'm glad we managed to go the whole the whole time without um, <laughs> you brought you brought it in the metaverse till now. <laughs> but the whole topic was, you know, she was she's like, I don't look at the metaverse as a technology. It's like I look at it like we're entering like a metaverse age, right? And it's like what we're doing, all these conversations, all the figuring out we're doing right now is 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 building kind of like the foundations for it right now. And it's it's not going to just be like a one single technology. It's going to be this like age of time that is is gonna i think unlock a lot of different ways of working a lot of different ways of uh, uh connecting um training um and just value in, in areas that we might not even be able to predict right now you know and i think that's just going to come with the the curve and the adoption over the next 10 years we'll see um I have a big bull prediction. I always say that my manager is probably tired of hearing me say, but I, I, I predict that, that companies and enterprises will have just like an internet, they'll have their own type of metaverse platform. Interesting. I like that take. So, so a world, a world of corporate metaverses. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's gonna, it's gonna have to be a, you know, a walled garden, you know, but you know, a, you know, whatever that standard ends up looking like. Um, so instead of, instead of hanging out on the Slack water cooler channel, you'll jump into some kind of VR water cooler space and yeah, you could, you know, companies will have their own spaces and their own environments and you could do a product showcase team event, a one-on-one, -on -one, you know, a training, whatever. I think it's going to unlock a lot of different, a lot of different potentials, but um, yeah, that's that's my take on that. I also just want to say, like, I think the whole industry, like, is like we're all in this together. I would say, you know, like we're we're all kind of one in a sense, and and like moving this forward, and like everyone, you know, from an MDM to a content creator to um, you know, an enthusiast to, you know, the training lead at a manufacturing site all is connected and kind of moving um, us forward into like a more, uh, a more connected and I think just like a more uh, immersive uh, way of working and a way of uh, connecting and, and through in, in the workplace, you know, um, and I've talked to a lot of different companies and, you know, <laughs> what it all kind of comes down to is everyone is still like figuring it out. 
Um, you know, not anyone is like, oh, this is exactly what you have to do. It's, you, know, you know, you got LMS, you need this content creation, you do this, blah, blah, blah. You know, I, I think it, it's people are figuring out bits and pieces of it. Um, and, and we're taking it as far as it can go right now, I would say. And uh, it's important to have forums and channels and communications that um, like this, that we can, we can talk about it and, you know, push kind of not, not push the agenda, but just be able to, to share. And, you know, really if, if, if there's success in one area, there's, it's going to lead to success in, in another area. Um, uh, or, or, or at least show somebody the way to how to be successful, I guess. <laughs> well said. Okay. I've got to get, ask you one more and this could be a quick answer, but something we talk about a lot is our why at Arbor is we believe VR at its best is a tool that actually gives us our time back, not uh, an avenue for more distraction. And I'm curious for you, why is VR important to you personally? And I'll just tee you up that when you said saving hundreds of hours with training, I immediately thought that's it, right? I'd 700, 700 hours before you get somebody on the line versus 400. That's somebody who doesn't have to spend those hours, um, you know, that they now can get in, be effective and, and do their job. Yeah, I, that's definitely a large aspect of it. And I think even like more broadly speaking, it's, it's like figuring out, you know, I don't think the vision for anybody, a, I feel like there's like an ethical component that's really important to me. And like, as we move into this space, I think we need, we need leaders and we need people talking about it right now that, you know, all agree that the vision isn't for us to be in virtual reality eight hours a day. Right. Like that's, that's not, realistic for anybody and probably not great for the, the, the overall whole of humanity either. Um, you know, but finding out where virtual reality fits in the societal and business worlds, um, consumer and enterprise worlds, where when you go into VR, you're doing something in there that is enhancing what you're doing when you're coming out. Like it's, it's enhancing, it's, it's not, you're not just going in there because you have to, you're going in there because when you come, when you come out, you're going to re-emerge into your physical world and, and your job and whatever you're doing with a better sense of awareness, a better sense of purpose, uh, feeling more connected to your, whatever you're doing at work. Um, and you know, there's, there's probably a whole laundry list there, but I'm, I'm running out of steam, but, uh, and that's really the way I look at it. It's like, how do, how do you, how do you build experiences that when you, that are going to add to your physical reality, you know, like, and, and, and that you could take away from that, that something that you could take away from that's just gonna, it's gonna benefit the overall quality of your work and the overall quality of your life. Right. Um, as opposed to just doing it to do it and maybe uh yeah i love no i love that i think one something we say is yeah it's a tool when a tool do, it, it a tool is something we use that helps us be more effective in our real life so i, I think that's uh that's well said so um if you lose sight of that it's like yeah you can't lose sight of that right it's easy to do yes but. it is it is it's uh it's a slippery slope well, Nick, this has been great. Uh, we really appreciate you sitting down with us today and uh, look forward to chatting again soon. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, guys. Looking forward to the next time. Man, this is exactly why we started Arbor XR, with the idea that VR is a tool that should give people their time back rather than an escape that just sucks more of our lives away. I know. The 700 hours down to 400 just blew my mind. It's exciting, and I think... And it's what we're hearing over and over again, but companies are seeing these kinds of real world results and uh, the future is bright. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Please don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts and we'll see you next time.